All right, and uh, again, today we're, we're, we're continuing the idea of uh, mobile media, media pushing the boundaries and pushing the boundaries of what we do, what we call a story, how we gather that story, excuse me, how we distribute it, uh, so that, uh, and in its widest variety of, of platforms and, and uh, ways of producing and gathering. So we're going to start with uh, Yusuf Omar. Uh, Yusuf, as he said, is the founder of Hashtag Your, Our Stories. And he uh, uh, is a, a vociferous advocate for mobile journalism and for uh, the, the power of the, the mobile device getting to individuals and bringing journalism into this, you know, the very human realm. So Yusuf, uh, it's all yours. No, I, uh, I no longer do. Um, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I am really, really happy and honored to be here. Um, I'm going to be mirroring off my phone, which should be responding any second now. Let's have a look. There we go. Cool. Um, so, yeah. Hi, guys. Oh, cool. So, yeah. Hi, guys. There we go. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it's perfect timing uh, for me to have joined you guys, having come off the back of yesterday's talks. I flew in yesterday from the Philippines. Um, I live in the cloud. I travel every single day of my life. I've been to 140 countries over the last two years, uh, training communities around the world to tell stories with their mobile devices and producing shows. And yesterday I had the ability to join quite late, but I had the chance to see the night presentation and, and Dan's piece. And what we saw was a bunch of different things coming together. We saw the discussion around artificial intelligence and what we call robo-journalism, right? The ability for algorithms to automate large parts of our industry. We then had Dan speaking about augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality. Um, and I think that we're reaching what can be described as a perfect storm. With 5G internet, with, with kind of speeds that are enabling us to consume faster than we are even able to uh, kind of uh, we can or at least download faster than we're able to consume, uh, coupled with, um, so 5G internet enabling high speeds, artificial intelligence enabling us to have access to information around us and what we can see at incredible good, uh, pace, and wearable devices enabling us to put information into our periphery, we're entering what can only be described as a perfect storm, where all of these elements are coming together. And as individual units, they haven't fundamentally changed journalism. For example, if I say to you guys, how many people have a VR headset in the room, virtual reality headset, right? Like two or three of you guys, and, and this happens to be a particularly dorky group of people, right? But the average uh, consumer doesn't. So as a standalone device, that hasn't fundamentally changed journalism. Artificial intelligence as a, a stand, standalone entity hasn't fundamentally changed journalism. 5G hasn't fundamentally changed journalism. But when it all comes together, the entire industry moves very quickly. So we have to consider these building blocks. And these building blocks are taking place very, very quickly. I hope my presentation will give some practical examples of things that we can be doing now that will get us ready for this future. And we can have a look at where the future of media is going by 2030. Has anyone seen the Minority Report movie? Right? Do you remember the scene, Tom Cruise operating the computer using his hands, uh, being able to split images, videos, cut things, um, looking at artificial information taking place sure around him, this dude eating a so hot dog or something. Under license registration. While watching his media. That kind of dystopian, weird looking future is not really the future, it's a reality. We can do a lot of that today. It's actually very, very, very accessible. As I said, my name's Yusuf. Um, I've been a mobile journalist for 10 years now. I wanted to be a foreign correspondent right back in 2010, and every newsroom said no. Don't have enough budgets, don't have enough resources. So in 2010, I, I gave them a middle finger and I started hitchhiking from South Africa all the way to Syria, from Durban to Damascus, up the east coast of Africa, 12,000 kilometers telling stories with mobile devices, and eventually moving to strapping cameras onto my body, onto my head, onto different parts of my anatomy. Uh, and since about 2015, 2016, I've worn cameras on my face. I'm wearing a camera right now. This is a Snapchat Spectacles. It has two cameras, and I'm recording a video of you right now. So I've been really, really interested in, in wearable technology. 
Um, I worked at CNN. I was a senior social media reporter. I was the mobile editor at the Hindustan Times, and I was a foreign correspondent for a news organization called E News Channel Africa. But about two years ago, we started hashtag Our Stories, and it was my wife and I. And we did it because when we looked at the traditional media landscape, they'd missed most of the biggest stories of our time. Um, they didn't see Donald Trump coming, and he ended up winning the US elections. They didn't see Brexit happening, and it ended up becoming a reality. Time and time again, traditional media were missing major, major stories, especially here in the US, because they weren't listening to real people and real voices on the ground. They'd lost touch with reality. Speaking to pollsters and pundits and experts and journalists that were infinitely more educated, wealthy, elitist than the average person. Hashtag Our Stories was the idea of the world through people's perspectives. The idea that if we could train communities on the ground to tell their own stories with mobile devices or wearable technology, we could gain access to stories and narratives that we'd never seen before, and we could have a better sense of what was really going on. Uh, we publish every day. Uh, we have a publication on, on, on Snapchat. Snapchat's also an investor in the company. And we reach about 7 million Americans every day. So we have an enormous distribution. Uh, we also, that figure's now changed. We now have close to 700,000 subscribers in, in our first year alone. 73% uh, of our audience are aged 13 to 24. So our audience are incredibly young, really young group of people, and most, mainly women. The stories that we, that we create, the stories that resonate most with our audience are, are mainly relating to young women. My name is Yusuf Omar and I'm a mojo, a mobile journalist. I wanted to be a foreign correspondent in Syria and they said I was too young. I wanted to tell stories across Africa and they said it was too dangerous. I wanted to start a global citizen journalism network and they said... Yeah, but this isn't journalism. I would die rather than do it. I don't want to watch it either. <laughs> Curating selfies isn't journalism. Five years old, when it happened... Look at these striking images. They're people wearing virtual face masks on Snapchat. Victims of sexual abuse in India are using them to remain anonymous because they can tell their Arab stories. More angles, more perspectives of hundreds of trained citizens creating stories that bring us together. I'm living with HIV. Imagine you get raped. Skills changed my life. Thousands of videos that challenge our understanding of the world. If the pen was mightier than the sword, mobile phones are our atomic agents of change. See, we're all trapped in this breaking news cycle. It all looks the same. Traditional media has credibility but lacks diversity. User-generated content has authenticity. I want to be a journalist. If we empower a generation of young people to tell stories with their phones, user-generated content can become more, so much more than breaking news and viral videos. Global stories from people's perspectives, change makers, innovators, unsung heroes. This is hashtag our story. So we really gain access to hard to reach stories and videos that you haven't seen before. Uh, communities all over the world in 140 countries that are submitting videos to us on a daily basis, which then are part of the show that we produce on Snapchat and other platforms. Now we've moved beyond simply mobile journalism and we're moving towards wearable journalism. So we've started rolling out these cameras and sending them to communities all over the world and they're starting to capture videos through their eyes. We are currently working on a documentary right here in the US with kids that have had traumatic amputations that have lost their arms or legs but are becoming professional athletes that are expel excelling in sport. Uh, and again, telling the story through their eyes, the idea being that if you walk a day in somebody's shoes, you understand their world and, and really trying to immerse you in, in their vantage point, their perspective. And as I said, for two years now, I've been filming my life through my eyes and, and the point of view offers you a really unique perspective on the world. My name is Yusuf Omar and I am a mobile journalist. You can balance. I'm also the co-founder of Hashtag Our Stories. We publish every day on Snapchat and we reach about 9 million people every month. Snapchat Spectrums liberated me. The ability to not have this third party camera, but rather look at the interaction between two people looking at each other is really quite an amazing way of looking at storytelling. Ah! This is crazy, this is my hand. And if we continue to connect us all through stories, we realize that we have more in common than we have apart. So, to give you an idea, of, and I fundamentally believe that by 2030, in, in nine or 10 years' time, every single one of us in this room will have a wearable camera on our face and probably won't be using a mobile phone in the way that we use it today. Uh, our entire computing experience will be on our face, and it'll be as close as a computer has ever come to your brain, right? Two centimeters away from your optic nerve connecting right to your brain. So a really, really intimate form of, of, of communication. To give you an idea of how 
much these sort of glasses and a wearable camera is gelled to my body, I forget that I'm even wearing them. In fact, I was uh, diving in India and I had my glasses on and I completely forgot that I was wearing them. Young professionals from across India are giving up their professional jobs, they're abandoning families and they're moving to the Andaman Islands to start diving. What the fuck? Jumanji! And I, I'd, I'd forgotten, I carried on on the boat, only realized halfway back to, to the shore um, that I'd lost my glasses. And you won't believe it, but, but a few weeks later, this Indian diver sent me a message. <laughs> In the middle of the Indian Ocean, he'd found my spectacles. Um, I could not believe it, this is a small world. Uh, but the idea here is that, yeah, the entire computing experience is moving from this to this to this to this to eventually us having just a singular pair of glasses. Uh, being the way in which we communicate. It's all moving into one device, uh, and we're very, very close to this point, and we need to be prepared for it. Bill Gates once said, we always overestimate the change that occurs in the next two years, and we underestimate what will occur in the next 10. Uh, so we really, really, as organizations, as media folks, we need to be paying attention to this trend, because it's going to move and change very, very quickly. We've been able to use wearable cameras in very interesting ways. Uh, in fact, we were working with human trafficking survivors, young women that had been kidnapped and forced into prostitution from Nigeria. And they didn't want to appear on camera, but we were able to tell the story through their eyes. So now if you do like <laughs> their perspectives, they were learning to so learn new skills. And this young woman showing her journey, storyboarding her story really giving us a, a vantage point as to her life moving from a farming background in Nigeria, glo global warming affecting water supplies. She had to move to city centers and that's where she was forced into human trafficking. Um, when I was working at, at, at CNN, I mean, this was my first day at this work. This is CNN. I've just been told I'm a crazy guy. I interviewed by, Christian Amantor with He's my glasses. Like, I'll come down here. Guy. He's just come from the Hindustan Times, the great time to be in news because you know, and Donald Trump has made journalism great. While I was interviewing Christiane Amanpour, uh, she said the word fuck on my, on my video. Uh, you know, just speaking candidly, she knew I was recording. And the next... Are you actually... Is that picture happening from your glasses? This is recording to Snapchat, that's going to Facebook Live. The next day, there was an email sent out to the entire CNN team, and anyone who's here from CNN would know, saying that you're not allowed to wear camera glasses at the office anymore. Uh, and that was on my first day of work. Um, <laughs> And I became that guy. They're like, are you the guy who? I was like, yeah, that's me. Uh, the point here is that the world is not ready yet for wearable technology in many respects. People are creeped out by it. They find it quite awkward. I think the fact that, that they have lights to tell you when you're recording is really important. But as we have this new landscape of people wearing wearable cameras, we're going to have to s kind of form new ethics and new policies around how we navigate this world. Snap's other major play could um, Yesterday, there was a lot of talk about Google Glass, and people said, yeah, well, Google Glass didn't work, so why will any of these technologies work? And yeah, they were famously known as glass holes, like Google Glass and asshole. Um, and it was the, the, the insecurity of people not knowing when they were being filmed that was incredibly um, nerve-wracking to people. But I think the applications of this technology is really interesting. I mean, even today, the Google Glass is still being utilized. It's being used in German factories uh, for people to be able to train and be able to understand the equipment around them. As news organizations, I think that our gateway into this world, into wearable journalism, has got to be augmented reality through the phone. And there's already been incredible progress made in this space. Uh, Pokemon Go being really the first uh, taste that most people had of, of augmented reality and the ability to chase creatures in our, in our periphery, chase creatures in our real world, uh, gave people an idea of where uh, and reality. what I'm going to do is I'm just going to I'm going to run to it and I'm going to mess up in, on purpose. Okay. okay. So, so Pokemon Go was interesting, but I think in terms of a, a kind of commercial application too, we've seen augmented reality move in really interesting ways. The ability to look at your foot and 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 try on a shoe uh, before you actually buy it is a really interesting notion. So this is an app that already exists today. And you can see what a shoe looks like on your foot. Uh, and also, IKEA, for example, IKEA are able to have a look at what furniture looks like. Right.
and the, the, the stories format, the vertical video clickable stories that has become the predominant way that people communicate on Facebook, on Instagram, on Snapchat, it's superseded or taken over from the newsfeed or the timeline as the main way people communicate, is the perfect gateway to augmented reality. It's really baked into that format as we start to open up our apps through the camera, building augmented reality applications in that space are becoming really interesting. To give you an idea, on Snapchat alone, there has been 600,000 augmented reality uh, effects that have been created. Uh, so over half a million have been created. It's moved incredibly quickly. But what makes me incredibly anxious and, 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 and worried is when I see journalism projects that are going to great lengths to create augmented effects, but within their own walled gardens. Yesterday, I met the team upstairs who had done really cool stuff. They've made all these augmented reality effects through this iPad and through their own app. But when I spoke to them about integrating that into Instagram or Facebook or Snapchat, they were not even aware that that was possible. And the more we silo ourselves in our own app and product development, which is useful too if we're going to counter the kind of rise of platforms, but we end up building inferior products and having inferior reach to if we were integrating some of our augmented reality ideas into existing apps. Being able to say, OK, the New York Times, for example, have got a cool augmented reality effect where they can look at the Winter Olympics on your dining room table. But they do that through the New York Times app. And yet we have the capability to do that through any app where we find the camera whether it's Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, Snapchat, anywhere where there's a camera, we can now build augmented reality effects. And I believe we have to decentralize our augmented reality. We have to put it across all platforms if we're going to have any chance of having substantial reach. The kinds of stuff you can do are quite interesting. I mean, I was playing around with this hummingbird recently at my house. Amazing. And it was tracking my hand. Uh, we've done interesting things with AR lenses. You guys might be familiar a few years back. In fact, the first time I came to speak at, at Gary's conference was when we used uh, face filters uh, to hide the faces of rape survivors while empowering them to tell their stories, while we still being able to see their eyes, their mouths, another application of, of, of AR. There are people wearing virtual face masks on Snapchat. Victims of sexual abuse in India are using them to remain anonymous so they can tell their harrowing stories without the fear of being recognized. I was five years old when it happened. It's incredibly simple, but as we saw... And as I mentioned to you guys at Hashtag Our Stories, we work with citizen journalists. But the problem has been the scalability of it. How do we continue to train communities around the world without Yusuf Omar having to fly to all these countries and meet all these individuals. Um, so now we've started training communities using augmented reality technology. And it's been a really, really exciting journey. To give you an idea of what this looks like, if I jump into my camera and let me open up a lens, we've been able to ask questions to audiences through augmented reality. So for example, Hey, what's happening? Well, I'm giving a speech here in Champaign, Illinois, a place that I would have never imagined I would be in. Where is it? It's in this hall. When is it happening? It's happening today. It's the opening session. It's just after 9 AM. Why is it happening? Because these are the thought leaders of the media world, and we are talking about the future. Who's involved? I'm involved. These guys are involved. Gary's involved. Um, how can you get involved? Well, you can come and join us next year. So the ability to hey, create... Hey, what's happening? Well, I'm giving a speech here. The ability to create augmented reality experiences where we can interview people, where somebody can be at uh, a hurricane that's taken place, and I'm able to distribute or disseminate information through the camera, which says, hey, get a shot of the ambulance arriving, get an interview with some, a survivor, uh, providing people with the tools to do better journalism. Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, these platforms helped us share, but they didn't tell people how to tell stories. We're really interested in how we can educate people to tell stories. Hey, what's happening? Um, well, I'm to give you guys another example, we did one around Black History Month. Um, these are all available. You guys can check them out online. Um, Black History. So this one was the ability to record people's reactions as they try and identify famous uh, people. So you've got to recognize the person in the bottom right. Uh, Martin who? Ah, yes, you got it right. Uh, who's this guy? He's kind of famous. Basketball player. You guys are good. Uh, she's a poet. All right. Who's that? You guys are too good at this. So 
famous the ability uh, to record people's reactions as they're as they're responding to those around Black History Month was a really interesting way uh, to kind of engage audiences. Um, and I mean, this is like it was. You saw that one, that one, this one we did with the United Nations. They wanted to poll 200 young people in Serbia about how they felt about the Sustainable Development Goals, and we were able to very quickly distribute these augmented reality surveys, effectively asking people questions and and, and curating those responses into content. The idea here is that we're able to, at speed, send out augmented reality lenses to communities around the world who've got stories to tell, and, and we can provide them with the tools to do it. I want to tell a story about how my community is saving water. Hey, I've got the right one. So we find a story of somebody telling a story, we provide them with augmented reality tools, we send it back to that person, and then they complete it and send it back to us, and that's how we produce that journalism. And if you wanted to get a sense of what some of those stories look like, I mean, if you, if you jumped into Snap, uh, you can see all the publications up top. Uh, this, for example, is a story we put out today. It's about an Indian uh, community who are using fruit peels in interesting ways. Every time uh, we walk in a day, there are... Um, or just to show you a couple more stories that we're, we've worked on recently. This is a piece that somebody sent to us, a 28-year-old, 29-year-old, who got breast cancer. I was diagnosed with breast cancer. The only thing I really know is that the tumor is large and in charge. Ow! I can just jump through all of this. That's a pro thing. And then through her phone. It had one. I don't really feel like. Woo! I did it! The last one. Keeping myself busy today. So she takes us through the full process. This is professional quality journalism produced by citizens, curated, verified, and fact checked by a team of journalists around the world. Uh, and using AR lenses to kind of help increase the quality of their storytelling. Um, where is AR going? It's moving in interesting ways. This is Microsoft HoloLens, uh, which is already an existing app. Or HoloLens 2 this has come out. This is a new vision this for work. Can look at a piece now of employees can work smarter and bring in the people they need with just a tap. She can have a phone call. They this can troubleshoot. Like tech. You can buy this today. Repair and perform. How would we be ready for that future? You won't be ready unless you start building augmented reality technologies today through the mobile camera. Oculus, we heard a lot about yesterday. One of the most incredible um, updates has been the ability to track fingers. Um, this is enabling us to no longer need uh, to use controls, but simply be able to control your devices using your hands. The finger tracking is something really exciting. You can imagine the impact of that on typing, on any kind of interaction with your, with your computing experience. If you think that the computers move from the computer to the, to the iPad, to the phone, to the face, the ability to interact with it with your hands, like we saw in the Minority Report example at the start, is really interesting. We've been able to use uh, the Oculus system and do Facebook Lives through an application called Facebook Spaces. Has anyone tried Facebook Spaces? It's an incredibly powerful tool. It's, it's just recently, as of this week, is closing down, and I'm going to show you why. Uh, but we've been able to do it, for example, in Ramallah, Palestine. And especially if there's communities that politically cannot meet in the same place, geographically are separated, um, we're able to bring these people together and produce shows in interesting ways. It's Palestine's first ever Facebook Live News show. We're going to be showing you all sorts of things from across the West Bank. It's a story of kids that are being arrested and kept in prison for months land over the years it's the, the land mass has become smaller and smaller and smaller so it's really really interesting the ability to do facebook lives as a virtual version of yourself a virtual version that's becoming more and more lifelike and then bring four or five other people around a common table to have discussions that product's actually been phased out this week and facebook are now launching facebook horizons which is a really exciting landscape the idea that your experience with social media platforms are moving from sort of 2D 
uh, timelines and news feeds and stories formats into worlds. And they're building worlds. And you can build a world, and I can build a world, and we can visit each other's worlds, um, which for journalism has amazing applications. It means we can teleport audiences to the front line of the Syrian civil war, and they can interact with real people who are there, a little bit like I suppose if you were playing Call of Duty today and interacting with real people who are simulating in a game, but this is the idea of your entire computing and your social media experience uh, being live in three different people's worlds. On my face. Welcome. This is Horizon. Think of me as your guide slash self-appointed spokes avatar here to show you around. You know, Horizon is filled with possibilities. You can play stuff, make stuff, fly stuff. Whoa, really love the stash, Stuart. What up, Stuart? Wait, I want a mustache. Horizon isn't about rules or limits or pants or people telling you not to fly an airplane while drinking your fresh ground, fair trade, French press morning coffee through a curly straw. Isn't that right, Debbie? Mm-hmm. It's about getting out there and trying new things, making your mark, making friends with an Australian named Mark. Oh, actually, I'm from New Zealand. So it's very easy to dismiss this technology and be like, these are cartoons with no legs. What on earth does this have to do with journalism? But if you think that the mobile phone democratized media today and has enabled anyone to tell a story anywhere, the future of that means anyone anywhere being able to create their own world, create their own studios. It means that the offering that NBC or CNN or any of these organizations have with their studios and multiple cameras and multiple correspondents around the world become smaller and smaller as people are able to set up virtual studios and virtually teleport to places all over the world. It becomes a really interesting landscape, especially when these images are indistinguishable from real life, where that person looks exactly like me. Um, in order to do all of this, as Dan mentioned yesterday, we need to start mapping our world and, and mapping it in 3D so we understand our landscape. We can only really apply augmented reality in a meaningful way if our devices understand where things are and what things are. They understand that you're a human and that's a chair and that's the back of the room. And this is being done already in really interesting ways. Facebook, for example, have announced a collaboration with the company that produces Ray-Ban. They are producing sunglasses. And they're looking now at how wearable technology is going to be able to map our world. To achieve this, Live Maps uses machine perception to construct multi-layer representations of the world, showing where you are in space, recognizing what things look like, and understanding the intrinsic meaning of objects. Connected devices, like smartphones and AR glasses, will scan the surroundings to create a live dynamic index, amplified by crowdsourced data, allowing the maps to recognize when things have changed and update automatically. Ultimately, our live maps research aims to empower people to connect and share in deeper, more meaningful ways. So in order to do this, how do we do it? How do we map the world without, as Dan mentioned, somebody walking around with a camera and going like this, or this, like this? I think, and, and it's been proven, that we do it through user-generated content. If you talk about people with phones that are capturing the world and what's happening with all of that data, one of the most interesting things that's happening is the ability to do volumetric captures. So Snapchat, for example, are able to take the 3 billion snaps that are produced every day and are now being able to capture massive monuments and landmarks such as the Eiffel Tower, Buckingham Palace, simply using people's content. If everybody's taken a photo of the same landmark, from many, many, many perspectives, that data together helps us draw a 3D model. And once we have a 3D model, we can do really interesting things on top of it. And I've been able to experiment with a bunch of these. I was in, in London a few weeks ago. We're in London today, but unfortunately, the scaffolding over the Big Ben. What? Oh my God! Or another example in, in New York City. Hey, we just arrived at the Flatiron building. It looks like it's covered in pizza. So it's uh, really interesting. But again, look beyond the gimmicks. Look beyond the idea that this is some cartoony pizza building and look at the potential for us to be able to look at a, a building and, and, and see the stock price of that company. Be able to look at a transport system and see what time a train or a bus is going to arrive. Uh, really being able to look at any landscape and, and have important information that's painted onto it. 
Um, and that's sort of where it brings me to what I, where I am right now. So I'm wearing the V3 spectacles. This is a camera, this is two cameras in fact. One camera here, one camera here. These come out in November, and, and the beauty of two cameras is I'm already capturing depth. I'm capturing the foreground and the background, and this camera is able to make sense of how far away things are from each other, which is a really interesting utility. Uh, just yesterday, while the talks were happening, I was experimenting with it, um, and you can see these pieces of lava are not touching the, the chairs, but they're coming out from below the chairs and beneath the chairs. Um, and this is what we're talking about when we talk about depth. We're talking about the ability for this camera to recognize that there's a chair here and put the lava behind it. Again, for journalistic applications, it means the ability to do a stand-up or with a reporter, and the reporter can say, hey, here's a Trump tweet, and the Trump, Trump tweet can pop up from behind them. Um, or the ability for the reporter to say, this is a crime scene, and the gun was located there, and the suspect left there, and to be able to put graphics in real time and locations uh, instantly, live, uh, is really, really interesting. Uh, to give you guys some more examples of how this stuff is using, these are some hearts. I was at a conference a few days ago, and these hearts are actually hitting and landing on individuals. Um, or this is sort of an underwater canvas, uh, and these fish, and this, this stingray or this manta ray understands the landscape and, and, and won't hit into things. Or these like kind of beams, that guy can go through the beams. Wow. Again, there's a stingray we have actually sitting eat, behind an individual. Uh, Where are the... So we are now in or there's like some Rose Garden, animations again sitting behind me. Santa Barbara. Oh, and we're going to have... Uh, it also enables us to do wiggle grams where we can talk about two images side by side and we can swivel between them to create a sense of, of, of depth on an image. So cameras creating depth are really, really interesting. Um, Arthur C. Clarke was a famous futurist. Famous futurist. He once said, any significant advancement in technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I think at this stage in, in this technology, a lot of it looks like magic, right? It's kind of can be seen as gimmicky, can be seen as a bit cartoony, can be seen as a little bit magical. But the applications for it and in terms of how we engage with our world and how wearable computing enables us to enhance our world is really interesting. This video was taken in the 1950s. And, and, and look at how uh, sort of how early people were at predicting where the world is going. Next half century, people will see as well as hear around the world. Pocket-sized radio instruments will enable individuals to communicate with anyone, anywhere. Newspapers, magazines, mail, and messages will be sent through the air at lightning speed and reproduced in the home. But 1952, they were already talking about this idea of magazines and video and stuff being able to move through the air into pocket-sized devices. And now we see an exponential growth in, in technology where I think in the next 10 years, it's going to change fundamentally. And perhaps we'll see a massive sea change where the experience that we have today of watching Netflix or YouTube or these kinds of mediums are not fundamentally different to how we watch television, right? It's still a 16 by 9 lean back experience. But now we're entering a fundamentally new world and unless we start experimenting with this technology of building AR lenses in existing apps such as Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, uh, and really understanding how to reach millions of people with this stuff today, we certainly won't be ready for a wearable feature tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I wondered if you could walk us through the workflow for a hashtag, our story, yeah. and tell us, first of all, how do the citizens find out about your app, and how do you find your news sources? Um, in a case like the, uh, the women who are telling stories of being raped, mm. how do you persuade them to go on camera? Because they still don't you know, they don't see that mask, right? They do, they do. And, oh, they do. Yeah, okay, yeah. but walk us through that and walk us through how you build the trust, how you find your sources, and then how you edit. Yeah, thank you so much for the, for the detailed question. Um, this is kind of to start out with the, the, the big picture of what the workflow looks like. Um, so we start out with these hundreds and hundreds of mobile journalists uh, that are assembled mainly in groups. So WhatsApp groups, Facebook groups, Telegram groups, Viber groups. Uh, 
who are submitting story ideas on a regular basis. That coupled with a programming calendar so that we know today is Women's Day or Human Rights Day. So those two things together, us having a programming calendar of events that we're watching. So for example, the cancer piece that I showed you, this month is Cancer Awareness Month. So we'll put out a call for, hey, we're looking for cancer awareness stories. Uh, and that coupled with a group of mobile journalists around the world. Um, and to give you an idea of what that process kind of looks like, um, are you active on Facebook? Um, so if I jump into Facebook, and I type in hashtag our stories, we have a page and a group. The group has about 3,200 people in it. And in this group, people are submitting story ideas on a regular basis. So if I just scroll through here, these are people that are uploading stories. Of course, these are not published to a broad community, right? This is a closed group where they share story ideas. Um, so these are lots of stories that people are sending in. Um, but if I keep scrolling down, we'll eventually get to story pitches. Um, lots of people have sent in lots of videos. Uh, and these can't be automatically posted. We have to approve the post before it goes up. And again, these are not published to a broader community. This is simply a training platform. Um, sorry, we had a bunch of people from the Philippines that sent in a bunch of videos over the last 24 hours. Okay, so here um, is an example of a story pitch. Sorry, pitch, OCD in depth. And this is somebody named Vanessa. I have obsessive compulsive disorder. When people think of OCD, they think of people that routinely wash their hands and are very clean. However, there's much more diverse obsessions from OCD than just that. So she's pitching a story idea. Our team will then inbox her and, and say, yes, we're keen to pursue this. Uh, we'll develop an augmented reality lens, which we'll distribute to her, which will provide her with all of the instructions that she needs to create the story. Um, so really, I suppose, in answer to your, your, and again, lots and lots and lots of people here submitting lots of story ideas from all over the world. This is another example from Miami. Um, so in answer to your first question, one, we gain trust by having gone in person. As I said, I, I physically went and met everybody that's pitching these ideas. I, I went to 140 countries. I trained up a lot of people. Um, and that can't be beaten, right? In-person, real-life training on our side means that we know the storytellers. They're not random people. Uh, and on their side, they trust us. They relate to us. And the fundamental difference between what we do and kind of like Storyful or one of these platforms is this is not user-generated content. It's not a video that you're just going to find online. We've helped raise the quality of somebody's storytelling um, and, and produce these shows. So I'm just going to jump back into here. Um, so the first part of the, of the workflow is creating a highly engaged community who are submitting story ideas on a regular basis, coupled with a programming calendar to know what's happening where around the world. Uh, we're then able to distribute augmented reality lenses to assist them to tell their stories, and we do this wherever they are. So if they work on Facebook, we send them a Facebook lens. If they're on Snapchat, Snapchat lens on Instagram and Instagram lens. Um, and because of these two steps, we're able to create daily repeatable formats. The big challenge of user-generated content to date has been that there's a lot of it, but most of it's shit. And a lot of it's seen as low quality. So if I just if I draw, if that, can you guys see that? Mm -hmm. yeah. If that iceberg represents all of the user-generated content in the world today, right now, traditional media are just taking this bit. And they're basically just taking the funny stuff, Chewbacca mum, somebody falling over, or the really fucked up stuff, the terror attacks, the, the, the trauma. We believe below all of this is about 2.8 billion phones. And if we can tap into those devices, we get access to hard to reach stories that people haven't seen before. So kind of that's where we're coming at this from, that hey, if we can lift the quality of all of that, we can gain access to amazing stories. Um, and yeah, we, we're really proud of the journalism that we do. Um, I think that there's often the, the biggest sort of at conferences, the biggest anxiety or criticism is, well, how do you know it's legitimate? How do you know it's factual? And that's what the journalists do. We spend at least eight hours on every story that somebody submits, uh, doing all the checks and balances, all of the fact checking, making sure all of our ducks are in a row. Um, because we work on closed platforms like Snapchat, where we can't afford to get it wrong. Uh, a bad story can be our last story uh, and our last source of revenue on those platforms too. Um, so we take the journalism very, very seriously. Does that answer your question in a very, very long way? <laughs> Yusuf, what is the process of distributing the lenses? The, who's paying for this? Are they returned? What, how, how does all of that work? Yeah, we build those lenses in-house. We distribute them through Messenger. So we'll send them through 
wherever we're chatting to that individual. It's an incredibly labor intensive process at the moment. We are looking to collaborate with anybody who's got experience building messenger bots. We're really interested in the idea of being able to have uh, a database of people around particular subject matters. So just say, hey, these are 50 people who we've spoken to who are passionate about LGBTQ stories. And here's 50 people who are passionate about sport. And then we can ping them with those lenses around particular subject matters. Um, so at the moment, it's very slow. We take on that cost. Uh, we do pay content creators depending on the, the, the level of, of contribution. If I'm doing a story like, uh, like this one, these recycling hacks, people recycling, that's like 30 people submitting a different recycling hack, so we don't pay for that, because those are individual kind of contributions of 10 or 15 seconds. Uh, but if we're doing a story like, um, like this one, Meet the Motorcycle Sisters, this was created by one storyteller in Kenya who submitted that content, so we pay for that story. And we pay between $100 and $200. Yusuf, since you work around the world, what is the most common technology, mobile technology, that you see worldwide, particularly in that lower 2.8 uh, billion phones? And do you have to adjust you know, what you send them based on your, your foreknowledge of what kind of phone they have? It's a great question. The first thing that we see is that the camera is becoming the primary input technology, right? So when we look at the Arab Spring, I was there during the first Arab Spring in Egypt. People didn't write letters to their mayor. They didn't write tweets even. Many of the people that started the Arab Spring were illiterate. They couldn't read or write. Their camera and sharing pictures of injustices were a fundamental catalyst for change. Uh, so we see even in the most emerging or developing economies, India, for example, where we deal with a smartphone that's $4 and has two cameras, a Freedom 251, People are using their camera to communicate. They are scanning things to pay for things. They're taking pictures of the water source when the water source is polluted. Um, so that's been really interested, interesting. On an even more technologically, I suppose technologically primitive, for lack of a better word, way, we've seen people use Bluetooth to transmit information. So in Kashmir, for example, when the cellular internet has been shut down, People have been transmitting to one another via Bluetooth and creating what could be called a mesh or a chain network where I send to you, who sends to you, who sends to you, and eventually you get it out to the broader world. Uh, we even saw one community in India where they were, didn't have enough data for, for video, and they were receiving their news via audio where somebody would come from door to door like a milkman and deliver via Bluetooth the audio bulletin and then would record their voice, which would contribute to the next bulletin. So they'd literally go from door to door and drop off the news as an audio bulletin via Bluetooth. Um, yeah, it was really cool. Um, what we are seeing around the world, and, and, I'm, and I'm a big believer in the, the cost of data will eventually become zero. Uh, marketing companies around the world, in India, in the Philippines, are, are footing the bill. They are, uh, Facebook, again, are, are taking responsibility for the cost of data. So the cost that people pay to access uh, the camera and to share content through the camera and to receive content via video is becoming less and less. Um, so we really believe that if many, many, many people around the world, they skipped dial-up internet, they skipped broadband, their first taste of the internet was 4G. And in the same way, many people will skip writing tweets and emails and their first taste of communication will be via the camera. Uh, so building for the camera is really, really important to us. So talk a little bit about privacy and, you know, constantly having a wearable device. I think your experience in the CNN newsroom is, is a great example of that, that, um, you know, and then, but, and then also the fact that your platforms depend on um, companies like Facebook mm. that suck up all of your personal data. How do you, how do you balance that? So it isn't really free. There is a cost. It's Absolutely. just that it's hidden from us. Yeah. Well, first, in terms of in terms of privacy, people, you're right, and I and I and I, I continue to say that I think there has to be a way to recognize that somebody's filming you, right? So, like for example, a big bright flashing light. But the idea of, of me having a camera on my face is not too different to the idea of having a, a phone in my top pocket or even holding a phone. Like, there's always the ability to record somebody without them knowing. And in most Western countries, 
you have actually very little right to privacy in the, in the public space. If, if you are outside and, and I want to take a video or photo of you, I, I can do so, and there's very little that you can do. Um, having said that, I, 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 uh, I still maintain that there has to be new laws and ethics and regulations set around wearable technology, because it's such a new terrain um, that people should be able to recognize when they're being recorded and have the opportunity to, uh, to hide their identity if they want to. And I think that will become easier and easier. If you are wearing a wearable technology and I'm wearing one and you choose to be blurred out, I think there'll be a way for our two devices to communicate. In terms of your second question, I totally agree. We are, as an organization, incredibly dependent on platforms. We don't have a website. I mean, you can go to our website. It's pretty much non-existent. We don't have a newsletter. We don't have a direct communication with our audience. We have 7 million Americans watching us every day. And if a platform choose to, they could literally turn the tap off on us. So we've built our house on somebody else's land, um, which is a, a risky position to be in. Uh, I think over the next three years, our, our, our goal has to be to have some owned and operated. Uh, I don't think that will be a website. I don't think my generation consume content on a website. I don't think that will be a newsletter either. Our generation don't use email. Um, so where and how that uh, experience lives, and it might be in real life experiences that we charge on, where people join us in real life settings, and that becomes where we harness our audience. I'm not sure yet, but it's a massive worry for me. It's 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 the biggest risk of our business today. When I when I meet investors, the the biggest risk is that, great, you've got great content, you've got a great system, you've got a great audience, but all of it could be taken from under your feet at any time, uh, and being held ransom by algorithms to which we have no control is is a legitimate fear of mine. I think just to add that the one thing that supersedes all of that is brand. If you build a brand of journalism that people love, they will come and find us wherever we are. So that if we left Snapchat today and moved to Netflix tomorrow, people would yearn for that content and they would go and find us. And if we say, oh no, now we're on um, Patreon and you've got to pay $5 a month to access our stuff, people will come there. So I think if we can build up a big, loyal brand of doing high quality journalism that people will be willing to pay for, they will come to us wherever we are. And that can help mitigate the risk of being platform dependent. This is a great audience, small but highly engaged. <clears throat> when you say we, how many people are you talking about? And also, what is the... Uh, how do you? How are you financed? Is it by these investors, or do you sell ads, or you know, how do you make your money, and and how many people are we? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm just trying to find a team slide. Um, we're currently a team of ten. Um, we're two years old. My uh, wife and co-founder Samaya is the CEO, and she actually runs the organization. Uh, I take care of editorial and tech. Ravi runs business. Naima sits in Johannesburg and, and runs our Snapchat edition. Uh, Mara is based in San Francisco. And at the bottom, we've got a bunch of uh, junior journalists out of Miami, South Africa. Um, we're, let me start by saying we're cash flow positive. We make money. We're, we make decent revenue. Um, if you want to understand our business model, we have four sources of revenue. First is ad revenue. We, we create content that lives on various platforms. And in between that content is ads that you watch. Um, so to give you an example of what those ads look like, um, if I just jump in here, and we watch a story. Uh, let's watch period hacks. For an extra pair of pants, an extra pair of underwear, so pads of different that. sizes, tampons, super plus tampons. There's the context that we add is. Life hacks for Main Street. Go pop the little stars in my jump shot. So, whether you watch that ad or not, it doesn't matter to us. We get paid on that ad. And cool. again, every fourth so snap, there'll be another ad. There's another ad for the New York Times. So, the New York Times are advertising on us, <laughs> which is kind of unusual. <laughs> um, so, yeah, our, our first source of revenue is ads. And the money that we make from ads alone finances the team that we have creating the content. Um, Second to that, we do branded content. So we have sponsored editorial that we work with, mainly NGOs, and, and, and clearly label it as such. To give you an example of what that looks like, um, this is a collaboration we did with World Vision. Uh, we took refugees in South Sudan and Uganda. We trained them to tell up stories with their phones. 
You are watching Bidi Bidi News, coming to you live from the refugee camp here in northern Uganda. We are reporting this story by refugees on mobile phones. Hello, YouTube. And we're looking at Peace Club, an initiative designed to connect host communities here in Uganda and the South Sudanese refugees who are fleeing a war. First up, we cross to Job, who is in the field, looking at how sport can be used to unite us. Job, what's happening there? Hello, YouTube. He shot this the ground. Best players to go and play outside in outside countries. Back to you in the studio. Thanks, Job, for that. So if our first source of revenue is ad revenue, our second source is branded content, working mainly with NGOs. And we have a clear policy that we only do branded content on stories that we would do anyway. So it has to be stuff that is aligned with our editorial values that we would do anyway. We wouldn't do uh, buy this Nike shoe. Um, our third source of revenue is creating these augmented reality lenses. So we work with a bunch of uh, NGOs and, and for-profit organizations. For example, we built um, this lens for the United Nations. So you could wear this, and these are the SDG, you know, Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and these are the, or for example, we worked with a group really called, care about this. Uh, World Skills. And we created a branded lens for them where you've got their branding on the glasses. For them where you've got their branding. And our fourth uh, source of revenue is, um, is training. We, we, we travel around the world and we train newsrooms predominantly, but also other organizations, how to tell stories with mobile devices and wearable technology. So first ads, second branded content, third augmented reality lenses, and fourth training. Uh, and as a sidebar, I suppose a few notes. One, we are aggressively hiring. We had a team of two in Jan. We're currently 10. We've got capacity for 10 more people. We can't fill these roles at the moment. Um, so if you guys know anyone who has got editorial integrity to make difficult decisions around user-generated content on a daily basis, but also understands an American 13-year-old, because our audience are 13 to 24. So really editorially sharp, but also <laughs> understands what a 13-year-old in America will consume. We could hire them as early as tomorrow. Um, we're really, really looking. And secondly, if you guys have got any networks within universities, we work with University of South Florida, University of Miami, University of Austin, Texas, we've worked with before. We are integrating hashtag our stories into the syllabus of these universities where uh, their assignments that they produce are real life stories, that they get real views, they build up a show reel. Um, we can really provide a platform for young people to reach millions and millions of people on a daily basis. Uh, they can join our diary meetings every day. We completely open up our content management system to young people. Um, so we're really, really interested in university partnerships, especially in the lead up to the 2020 elections. We want to have an idea of what's happening in these parts of America that are often forgotten by traditional media. Um, so one, we're hiring. Two, we want to work with students across the US. And we'll pay them. We'll, we'll, we'll provide them with, with uh, an income. Hey. Great presentation, <clears throat> Yusuf. Um, on the topic of students, uh, for some of us in the audience that are educators, um, what would you say would be some of the major skills that you think journalism students need to have moving forward to move into this space of augmented reality and storytelling? Thank you so much. I, it, 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 it is really daunting to me when I visit US universities and I see how much of a focus they still have on local television news. Um, I just spent a, a week in Tampa Bay last week, and I, and I visited tons of unis. And both as lecturers and as students, the obsession is on how do I become a news anchor or producer for Florida Focus, or whatever your local television station is. And it's sad, because they're training people up for an industry that doesn't exist anymore, or is rapidly dying. Um, in terms of how can young people get into the AR space, one, I would love to see students that are building in AR Spark and Lens Studio. So these are two pieces of software that are available and free to everyone, where you can build lenses within Instagram, Facebook, and Snapchat. And it's super simple. The, the, the templates are already there, and it's amazingly easy to start creating. But that's only half of the equation. You can create the most amazing augmented reality experience. But if you haven't developed a storytelling channel parallel to that to distribute those lenses, 
nobody's going to use them. In the same way that the team I met upstairs were creating AR features that were amazing, but unless you download their app, no one's going to use it. Um, so I think in answer to your question, you need to have two channels. One is what I suppose you'd call advanced reporting, which is how do we create highly engaging vertical video content with cues to swipe up to lenses? And two, how do we create lenses which create a flywheel to create another piece of content? The end goal of an AR experience, for me at least, is not necessarily to showcase this is what a ski ramp looks like. It's to provide a stimulus to create the next piece of content. So it's a, it's a circle. That lens creates the next story, which creates the next lens, which creates the next story. So I think building for that two, potentially two courses, one building out the lenses and one building out the storytelling beside it, uh, would be really interesting. Uh, and we would be happy to help with the training on that, um, that process. So kind of piggybacking on that, is it too late for people over 50 no, to be a part of this? Oh, you're so kind. No, no, not at all. Um, I always say that like, often when we look at democratization of mobile cameras, it's seen as this threat to journalism, right? That, but the reality is we need more seasoned editors and journalists than we've ever had before. The basics of one, fact-checking and verifying, but two, creating a story that has all of the who, where, what, where, and why, how, the substance of journalism, the context, that doesn't change. Um, and I think that seasoned editors, especially, are able to identify moments and movements better than young people. Uh, younger people are good at saying, oh, everyone's talking about uh, this Me Too protest. But it's our seasoned editors that have got years of experience and can say, OK, there's a bigger theme here of gender at play. And this is how we're going to tackle it. Um, and I think we need that skill set now more than ever. Because the better we can forward plan those movements or moments, uh, young startup media companies like us will make our name if we, can, if we can build around one of those, if we can really escalate it. The next Black Lives Matter, whatever that might be, if we can identify that early and we can build communities around that and we can capture that in a way that nobody else is capturing it because we've got seasoned editors who can forecast those kinds of things, I think that will be incredibly powerful. Um, this is less a question than a comment. Uh, I think uh, you're, you're talking a lot about understanding a 13-year-old and and aiming at a young audience, which I think is good. But when you think about 2020 yeah. and this region of the country, yeah. I think pushing this technology out to communities, especially news deserts where people don't have mm. news outlets, and allowing people, including older people, to tell their stories could be very powerful. Yeah, for sure. And, and we need to get better at that. One of the shortfalls of our organization is we, we started to create global empathy and understanding and bring people together. And in our pursuit of, of views and reach and really doing the stories that we wanted to do, we've kind of pushed ourselves in a very, very liberal left direction in terms of like uh, tampons and this and that and women's issues. And we've lost a huge part of the internet uh, that are, are slightly older and are slightly less prescribed to these values. And I think you're right. I think if we can tap into those demographics, the older people, the people that are across a broad spectrum of media uh, and interest, it would be really interesting and really powerful. Um, because we've definitely leaned too far into the young woman, sort of uh, very liberal sort of corner of the internet. And in, in doing so, we've left out the rest. And that means we're no longer connecting and bringing people together. We're really just talking to this group here. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in doing that. Uh, I don't know. If that is done, if you're talking for an older demographic or another demographic, I assume that it's done as a different channel. I think you have to serve different channels to different audiences. Because in creating content for that audience that you described and engaging those voices, we may alienate this community who are pro-LGBTQ, pro-transgender communities. Do you know what I mean? Um, so I think we might have to fragment in that respect and then start joining those those. Yeah, maybe, but that, that again is the danger, right? Yeah, that that we build our walled siloing. gardens in a different way. And, yeah. uh, and so I don't have the answer, but I think it's a problem we need to grapple with. Yeah, totally. 
it's it, it, it is incredibly easy to, 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 to create yourself or to corner yourself in one part of the internet. Um, and yeah, it's important to work that out. So how would you recommend um, for organizations that are more legacy or, you know, again, small and, and but kind of buried in a inverted pyramid kind of journalism, um, how do you how do you start uh, tiptoeing into this type of medium? How do you how do you get started? One, I think you start it in house where your reporters start producing mobile orientated content. So if you're a radio station or a newspaper, um, I always encourage reporters to start thinking about their mobile camera as their notepad. So stop using a notepad, or if you're doing radio, stop using a recorder. Use your mobile camera as a pure method of, of, of recording content. I think that's an instant cultural shift, which will create an enormous amount more video content around that brand. Uh, and two, I think it's just training. I think if you're a small to medium-sized organization, listen to your community. See which parts of the community you're not engaging, whether it's migrant communities, women's groups. Train those communities up to tell their own stories, which is not difficult to do. It's a two or three day workshop. It doesn't cost an awful amount. Uh, and start curating those voices. Uh, it's a lot easier than people think. Uh, when you are offering people free skills and free training, you'll find you'll have a room full of people that are willing to, to share their voices. And with that, uh, just a quick note that Yusuf will be here all day and he'll be uh, doing some training with Brandt students uh, later in the afternoon that any of us could join in on. So uh, we've got uh, all day to chat with him more individually about all these ideas, as well as if we want some hands-on training in, this, in the specific technologies that he's talking about, that will be uh, early this afternoon. So uh, we'll get back here in about 10 minutes with Ray Soto uh, talking more about <laughs> AR, and, <laughs> AR and VR and uh, uh, USA Today Network's uh, uh, use of it. Thanks. Thank you so much.